united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning. My name is Jack Berg and I'm pastor at Sun Valley Baptist Church. We're located at 9901 Macombs out in Northeast El Paso. We're only 11 minutes from the east side. We're 15 minutes from the west side and we'd love to have you join us some Sunday. My wife uh, helps me in the ministry and is a leader in the ministry. Her name is Josie. Of course, today she's been a grandma to two kids who are online schooling and she's helping them out today. But ordinarily she's there and she leads a women's group and a Bible study that we have. We also have a Christian school there. That Christian school is called Northeast Christian Academy. It's also better probably known as NECA. And we have been around since 1977. We're growing this year on a fantastic rate, especially in the younger grades as people f find out about the online learning. And if you'd like more information on the church, on the times, you can look on our website, you can look on Facebook, we're on both, or you can call the church and school and they'll be glad to give you all the times. But we do have face-to-face -face services at 9.45 for Sunday school, at 11 for church, Sunday night at 6.30, Wednesday night at seven o'clock, and uh, we are all face-to-face as well as the school classes are being taught face-to-face. And we, haven't, uh, we have not had a problem with COVID. We have been very careful and we appreciate uh, those who helped us and uh, been very good to us during this time. But I may ask, you know, again, we would love to have you vi visit with us. Last time we were looking at the 70th week of Daniel and we came to a point in, in the slides that uh, you can see that on that presentation that the day of the Lord begins after the sixth seal is broken in Revelation. Now that's a seal that's sealed with seven, that is closed with seven seals. It actually represents the title deed to the earth. And of course, at this point, that title deed in some respects belongs to Satan. But Christ is gonna take it back. But in that process, as he takes it back, there's some terrible things that occur on the earth. I know that many people believe we have a pre-tribulation rapture, but you know, along with that pre-tribulation, you have to answer some questions because in Thessalonians, we're told that before, before that seven year can start, the man of sin and the apostasy of the church and those around it must occur. Elijah must return. And I think Elijah and Enoch both are there and they do their work when those first four seals are opened. Um, Elijah and Enoch are there to prophesy to the middle of the, the uh, trip, the seven year period of 70th week of Daniel. It's been so many years of saying the tribulation period, it's hard to get rid of it. But you know, it's not all the tribulation period. There is a part, it says cut short on top of it, there is a part underneath it that says the tribulation. Scripture says the great tribulation. It's a short time. I, don't, I know when it begins, I can tell you, it begins at the beginning of the midpoint. When the midpoint occurs at seven years, 1260 days, and by the way, those are prophetic years and days that are used here. They're lined up more with the Jewish calendar than they are with ours. So it's 1260 days or, or three and a half years. And there, you know, that, that's a period of Satan trying to destroy the Jews and Christians. He is trying to make God break his promise. I know that Daniel 2, Daniel 7, both say that Christians, believing Jews and Christians will come into submission underneath the Antichrist. That's a horrible thought. And that's also the period it says we will have the 666 number that everybody looks around to find. Don't try and put that in English, it doesn't work. It only works in Greek or Hebrew. But the big thing, point there is at that time frame, 
is Satan's wrath at us, at Christians and Jews to destroy us. He wants God, he wants to show that God can't keep his promises on earth. And God is going to allow us to get into a position where there's no one that we can turn to except him. Then he comes to us and first off, he raptures us out as he begins the wrath of God. And the day of the Lord begins uh, to say, tell the world, hey, I'm going to remake it and I'm going to destroy <clears throat> Satan and his, his, uh, his period. Let me run very quickly through this. There's one thing that's different on this slide. This slide shows a period of silence. That silence in heaven is right before the wrath of God starts. And when that wrath begins, it says right before it, there's a half hour silence in heaven. That's the way of saying this is such a, a period that we're gonna come into and it's so terrible, so hard that we uh, that there is a a silence like there would be if somebody had, had announced suddenly that something terrible is going to happen and people don't know what to say and they just sit in silence. It's going to be the same way here. And that period of silence indicates that God's day of the Lord or his wrath is about to start. Now remember, we're gone. Christians are gone out of this. They're not a part of it. There's seven trumpets though that begin at the end of that half hour period. And those seven trumpets begin to tell us certain things and they are each one involves itself with the, the part of the wrath of God. I don't know some places where we have meteors, how God does it, I don't know. But I know that we see some things that occurred during the time of the Exodus will occur again in uh, oh, things like those will occur again in that day of the Lord. Along with that will come <clears throat> meaning it's, it's all God's wrath. When that seventh trumpet is gone and that, that blowing, and that's at the end of the seven year period, Satan is taken and he's locked up. We also see the seven wrath, bowls of wrath that are poured out on the earth. And those are done during a period that's, that's listed in Daniel chapter 12, that's listed, it's not listed anywhere else. I might point out one thing to you, if you can turn to Dan Daniel 12, so that I can just show you something that is, I think, um, I think just tremendous in its prophetic view and also in how God accurate God is. And may I say to you that as we look at the book of Daniel, it's a book which we have copies which predate the time and place of these prophecies that are given. And that's important. There's so much archeology span that's been done in the last few years we now are able to establish seals from 53 men in, in the Old Testament. That includes Isaiah the prophet and Jeremiah the prophet. These were royal prophets. And we see those seals that they had, we have found them and we know that they really existed. You know, you know and that's not saying we need that for our faith, but what that does is to strengthen our faith. It, it should give us a grasp that God is, is throughout history and he's guiding and directing history to bring about what he wants at that point. In Daniel chapter 12, it says, at that time, so Michael, the archangel, that's not in scripture, but that's his title, stands up the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation ever to that same time. And this is the truth. This is the wrath of God during that last seven year period, the tail end of it. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Can I suggest to you, if you want to be a star in heaven, put out the word of God. Win people to Christ. And that's, you know, that's exactly what the tail end of this says. They that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This is, this is a faith that is given by God, but it's a faith that's meant to be alive 
It is meant to be something which touches lives and changes hearts. Verse number four says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. And even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked and beheld, there stood another two, the one on his, this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in fine linen, which is upon, was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand into heaven and swore by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half. That means seven years in prophetic terms. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the, uh, the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not, and said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for thy words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from that time that, they, that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. He is setting now in Jerusalem. And he said the abomination of desolation is there. Christ uses his verse in Matthew chapter 24 to say, this is the beginning. This is that green arrow that's in the middle. It's, it separates everything here. It begins to a period first against us and then against the Antichrist. But go thy way till the end be and for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. You know, if you've looked very carefully, there's actually 75 days that are given here that are not accounted for anywhere in Scripture. But they have to be important. They have to be very important. And what's interesting is we have some of the feasts. I know that the station here is doing the holy days with the temple here. And you know, it's kind of interesting and maybe well worth your watching to get to the meaning of it. But at the end of it, we have the Feast of Tabernacles. And from the Feast of Tabernacles, that's 70, it's exactly 75 days to a feast that's called Hanukkah. Now, Hanukkah is not listed as a biblical feast. And a lot of people say it can't be Hanukkah. Christ used Hanukkah, though, or the Feast of Dedication, Feast of Lights. It's used both terms in Scripture. And it tells us that that 75 days is a, it's a time frame in there when God is cleansing the earth. It's exactly 75 days from tabernacle to Hanukkah. And Hanukkah deals with a miracle which occurred between the Old and New Testament, which occurred when the, the oil for the menorah that should have lasted for a day instead lasts for seven days. It was a miracle. God supplied it and did it. And that's why it's called the Feast of Dedication of the Temple or the Feast of Lights. And it's a great time to be in Israel. It really is. Many people say they don't like it because they think that they get gifts on uh, seven nights. That's not true, even though some do get that. But you know what's important here is, is what are the disciples asking? They're on the Mount of Olives. They're sitting there looking at the temple. And you know what they're saying and asking is, hey, Lord, what is the sign of your coming? Not signs, the sign of your coming is singular. So they're asking for something that's in particular, the sign of the Son. And they need to, the Son of God. They need to, to see this and understand it. And Christ gives it to them. Oh, he leaves out a great deal until the book of Revelation is written. Although Thessalonians and several other places sure give us some hints. But Mark chapter 13, verse number four says, what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Matthew 24, 30, then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. Verse 29 says, tells when immediately after the tribulation of those days, uh, the sun and the moon are dark and the stars fall. Think about that for a minute. 
what that means. You ever been in a, a cavern when they shut the lights off and you can't see anything? You can put your hands in front of your face and you can't see anything. I've heard several men say, and I would agree with them too, that when that occurs and you're in that kind of a situation, and as a younger man, I was in a situation for about two or three minutes where I had no light. Other people had them, but I didn't. And I suddenly found myself in a position of being uh, in a cave. I wasn't familiar with it. I was on a rock and all of a sudden it's dark. And I'll have to admit in about two or three minutes, I was getting pretty anxious, but this is a darkness that's not going to end for a while. And it's a darkness. that's going to bring fear to the ungodly. Now remember once again, we're gone before this starts, but we do have some signs that occur in here that tells us it's time. Isaiah 13, 6, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Can I suggest to you, if you're a good Bible student, take a look at where it says the day of the Lord or it says that day, the day. You know what? There's over, there's almost 2,000 references to that day or the day. You know, if we say that in English, that means we're looking for a given day. The same thing's true in Hebrew. We're looking for a given day, the day. And that's true here, the day of the Lord. <clears throat> and it's looking for a singular day when things are kicked off, when the wrath of God begins. And the stars and the sun and the moon are darkened. I'm not, you know, I'm not, what I'm doing here is re reading from scripture, but in all honesty, it's very repetitive. Whether it's new, Old Testament or new. Verse 11, I will punish the world. God's angry. The world's been destroyed. We were given, we were given the responsibility to, to uh, take care of it. Instead, we destroyed it. And Revelation says the same thing. I will destroy those who destroyed the earth. It's his earth. And we've hurt it. We've destroyed it. Verse 13 is called wrath in Isaiah 13, 6. It's uh, and, and in Isaiah 13. It's all called wrath. Let me catch up here because I touched up wrong. Revelation chapter six, the sun becomes black. The moon is blood. And you're going to find this is repeated in the Old Testament as well. The stars fell, the heaven rolls back. By the way, if you're a quantum physics person and I'm, I've got one in the church, you might look because there is a quantum physics principle that allows to see how God has spread the heavens like a sheet and have the light that so we see from the furthest sun or the furthest stars rather come to the earth immediately. It's the wrath of the lamb in Revelation chapter six. It's the great day of his wrath. And it's the lamb's wrath. It's Christ's wrath. Joel chapter one, verse 15 says, the day of the Lord is at hand. I Joel chapter two, verse 31, the sun is turned into darkness before before the sun and the moon are darkened in Joel chapter 3, 15. Amos chapter 5, 18, the day of the Lord is darkness. Acts 2, 20, the sun is darkened, the moon becomes blood. Ezekiel 30, uh, verse number 3, a cloudy day, day of the heathen. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 says the day of the Lord like a thief in the night. Yes, he comes like a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming. But if you look very careful at those verses, almost every one of them says the day and the hour, day and hour. But it also says in Thessalonians to Christian people, you should not be caught like he's coming as a thief in the night. We're of the light. We can see the signs. We can see what's coming. We can understand what's coming. We can believe what's coming, even though we don't want to believe in the horror that it's going to bring upon the world. And even the things that we might go through like this. Don't buy, and they're in, in uh, Thessalonians, they're there. All, both, both Thessalonians are highly prophetic. But read them, read them, not just cursory run over the top. And what it really says to us is, hey, we really are in for a time that's terrible. Do I think we're in that time? I think we're, 
I think we're approaching that time. What we need is a peace treaty which allows the Palestinians and the uh, Muslims somehow to do, uh, build a new temple on the third, uh, a third temple on the Temple Mount. It's a time of God shaking the earth. It's destruction from the Almighty. It's divine wrath, anger, and terror. It's punishment for evil and wickedness. It's a time of darkness in the heavens. It's a time of fire from the Lord. It's a time of the wrath of God against the nations. When it says wrath, we're out. When it doesn't say wrath, we are possibly here. Please don't look at the star, I mean, at the hurricanes and the fires and the COVID and say, this is the wrath. It's not. It's not even anything near the wrath of God. Yes, these may be judgments. Maybe. They may be things that God has sent to wake us up. But they have been going on in some of these areas for many, many years. And they go on all around the world. Christians die on a, on a daily basis from things that are natural. I don't know why, but we need to understand that when the day of the Lord starts, we'll be able to see this sign of the sun in heaven as he begins to come down and we're prepared with our new bodies to go up to meet him. I would ask you a question here. Did Christ get his new body after he ascended into heaven or did he already have it when he was here on earth? Because if I read it correctly, he got his new body before he ascended into heaven. He'd had it for a while. Are we in the same position where we get new bodies and we later ascend into the heavens with Christ? I know that what I'm saying runs contrary to a lot of things that, that uh, people have been taught. It runs contrary to what I was taught as a young man. And I was taught by a very good Bible preacher here in, in El Paso who admitted to me right before he died, he was having some second thoughts that had really bothered him all along. And it was, what's really important here is I take it from Scripture. You know, on Wednesday nights, we do prophecy at the church. You're more than welcome to be there. If you have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those questions. And more than happy to sit down and show you things in Scripture. I know here it seems like we're so short and we're pushed, and we are. However... There are things that we can help you and deal with and answer your questions that, uh, that would help you to see what the truth is. And I think the truth is, is what we call pre-wrath is going to be the answer. It fits with the chronology of Scripture. It fits with everything that, that we see in Scripture. We see God shaking the earth. We see the destruction from the Almighty. We're not here. But also it says... We will fight the Antichrist. You know, the early church, every early church father believed we would see the Antichrist. The church would see the Antichrist. And we would fight the Antichrist. Revelation 19, I think it is, says, again, we'll fight the Antichrist. And we'll lose. We'll be in submission to him. And I know for a lot of people that... That's not the, the message we want to hear. I'd rather, just like you do, I would rather have uh, uh, the, the scene where I'm taken off before it all starts. And I wish I could tell you that, but I think as we look in Scripture, it's simply not true. And we need to be aware of what's coming on. And I think that's one of the things that's hard. And I, I don't, I think Scripture, I think Scripture was designed and meant for the average man to be able to read it, to be able to deal with it, and be able to learn from it in a way that he doesn't need to be a Greek scholar. And I say that because Revelation chapter 6 verse 17 says the great day of his wrath. It's not seven years long. It's a shorter period, but it's a terrible period. And I know a lot of people would say, well, if you know the Greek, you would say this is an action that has already started. But I've got a dozen other Greek scholars who say something entirely different. If I take it for what it says, and I think the translation is good, and it's the same in almost every single translation we have, it says the great day of his wrath, of the Lamb's wrath has come. It always starts with the same signs. 
always starts with the same signs. There's no mocking or scorning of God on this day. They call for the rocks to fall on them. What's significant is they do not turn to God, even when Elijah comes to preach to them. And Elijah and Enoch, I think, have been preaching to them all along. People would tell me, you know what? You cannot have the church working with Israel. The two cannot exist side by side. They have existed side by side formally from 19, May the 7th, 1948 on. But they were already working together before then. There were many Christian Zionists and they were working with the nation of Israel before it's actually officially declared a nation of Israel. And then when it was, they worked with it hand in hand. Today, the greatest ally that Israel has is a Christian nation. I'm using that term really broadly. We need to return to be a Christian nation. And we do have an election coming up, which I think is vital and important for us to be a part of. And I think when Elijah comes back again, he, they're not going to uh, respond to him. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 1. Malachi is the last uh, book in the Old Testament. And Malachi chapter 4 says he must be here. He must come back before the great day of the Lord. He must come back. There are things which must happen for the tripture, rapture rather, if you are pre-trib. And yet I cannot do that. You know what really counts? All these things, we can look at them and say, and I have, I have people who have told me, look, I don't want to hear this. This scares me. It frightens me. That's what it's meant to do. It's supposed to scare you. It scares me. And it scares me because I really don't want to go through it. I'm 79 years old. It's going to be hard for me to, to survive that period. Reality of it is, though, I can look beyond that period, and there's a light a great light at the end of the tunnel in this case. And it's a light which will shine forever because it's the light of Christ. It will be the light that will shine on us in the new Jerusalem or in heaven. No sun, just no heat, just beautiful days and day after day, ones that are perfect and ones that we can look at and say, this really is more than I expected. And it's life eternal. Please consider yourself and your actions or consider your standing before God. Please do that. We thank you for coming and being with us today. And perhaps we'll have time in the future.